Hello everyone, today we talk about the many phases of the 10th to 11th century night. Uh, you know that since last year we began this series that is fundamentally masked. It stays mostly under the the knighthood, medieval knighthood playlist where we discuss mostly about that. But that, that addresses fundamentally probably the, the roots of medieval uh, cavalry and, and chivalry and lots of other things that naturally stemmed from there but also died at a certain point exactly in this time when where the militia proper uh, came to be defined in uh, in Western Europe exactly during the, the 10th the 11th century as something that we are trying to define and that cannot find indeed a mm, singular soul uh, definition, categorization, classification, it's fundamentally impossible. So today we talk a bit about this all and what is that we mean when we try to explain what the, the militas were, right, and what their, uh, their, their s political, social and naturally also military status actually was, right, and what is that they actually had in common, what is instead that make them differ uh, at so many levels because we have stressed not just on this uh, series of videos but more in general you know you know that I have a you know my probably even my bias in a way uh, not much for you know my my origins or ideological reasons of sort but you know I, I truly gave even thanks to Schwerpunkt and something that I didn't fully notice uh, up to a certain point in my studies uh, of the legacy of the Frankish uh, vassalatic, feudal vassalatic world, if you want, vassalatic beneficiary system, um, on a long run and broadly meant, like not just talking about the, the Franks themselves, but whatever, especially the, 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 the Carolingian Empire at that point, and it's, uh, it's in there, it's a political social system, and all the consequences of it, right? So we don't want to deny that. We don't want to, you know, pretend that the differences here are just something so substantial or essential that cannot allow us to, to draw um, an idea of what the uh, a historical, let's say, assessment better, because the idea is, is also a different thing in our popular culture, etc. What the, in fact, the Miles really was, right? And it's the same Miles, probably, the, the correct answer, because... That's what we remained with, even just as a civilization, and for a much longer time than we think. Chivalry didn't, uh, let's say, properly cavalry, and in, 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 in this sense, the militia and the, the nobility uh, associated to it didn't die at all with the Middle Ages. We have seen it just recently in a pair of videos on Renaissance warfare that we think it all of a sudden, you know, Firearms came up, and uh, the and cavalry or in chivalry died. This is not correct. As a matter of fact, from a strictly political and military point of view, you can't fail but to recognize that this system died only, and not even after much of a uh, of an agony. Telling the truth, either you know, in, in this time span, it goes from 1789 to uh, to 1918. Uh, in different areas of Europe that had been also and fundamentally encompassed by this Frankization of, of nobility up to this point. I know that we are using broad spanning uh, paradigms and, and factors and denominations in here, but if we think about the core of where this all originated, at some point we, we see it exactly in the 10th and 11th century. And today we mostly look at actually the, the 10th and the 11th century as the, um, the, find, the the point of arrival, of course not in a strictly teleological sense that did, or deterministic sense that did not, did not find space in, in, in actual history, but you know, in, at least in, a, um, in, a, in this constant flow and stream of, of transformation. So lots of other aspects concerning the the tribal if you want even pagan of course um, tradition and vision of the world that was instead at least not not erased completely at all 
uh, in many ways, but it was framed and controlled and regulated and, and naturally changed in the long run by the creation of the militia as we know it exactly from this centuries. And it's a long path that we still have to, to make fully, right? That will bring us essentially from the, uh, the steppes of Asia to the uh, lands and forests of, of Europe, right? From the shamanic cults to the um, Christian Benedict blessing of, of arms and armored men. Right, we have made actually a video on the Militia Christi of Pauline um, memory are also the Novi Militas that were solemnly mm, welcomed in the Romano-Germanic liturgy uh, as you know, that, now the, the new protectors of, of the Christian society uh, itself. So naturally this path is not always clearly uh, outlined, right? Uh, it's uh, it. It really has to do, as you understand here, and th that you understand how the the Frankish legacy is important, right? This process was happening in many ways, even in those lands that hadn't been framed under the system, had been barely influenced by it. Think about, uh, I don't know, 10th century Scandinavia. Right? Surely, things there weren't under the the, the direct influence of the the Frankish world, but on the long run, you know, did this. Societies had already absorbed what the, the, the transition, even within their same, their own properly domestic internal tra transformations. We've made at this point a couple, of, you know, videos on, on several contexts of this kind. Even Anglo-Saxon England, for example, wasn't Frankish system before 1066, uh, uh, and um, that witnesses similar changes towards. Uh, kind of a, we, we can't call it properly vassalatic, but here the, the terminology is also relative, like you should, we should stay flexible, but it, it's obvious that the importance of the of, of the heavy cavalry men rises in Northern Europe, even uh, aside from from the Frankish war. The same goes for, even for other realities. This is happening, happening for example, even in the Slavic world. Uh, it's happening in many ways even in the same Byzantine Empire. Right, in a completely different way under s certain points of view, but essentially with the same outcomes. That's what I, I like to point out that very often, actually, if you look at 11th century warfare between Europe and the Mediterranean, you see that essentially, you know, that there is a great deal of symmetry for Frankish, Byzantine, and Islamic armies. Like, they're, they're actually very, very similar to each other because they are fundamentally similar. Pre industrial societies that work essentially in the same exact way. Um, and they produce that mills resistance that, after all, has even in, in those other cultures actually, the, the, in many ways, the same old roots of the step. Don't think of the step here is the step is actually overlooked. We will see more clearly how um, sometimes, even for a mechanistic to to logistic prejudice, if we think there are people who say, you know, um, chivalry, you know, excuse me, cavalry, heavy cavalry, the idea of knighthood in many ways, stemmed in Western Europe from, I don't know, the contact between the Romans and, and uh, the Persians because of, you know, the cataphracts came from there, so you have to make the equation, aside from, you know, throwing in just Sarmatians just to, 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 to find a closer um, connection, but uh, what about properly the step? I mean, where is that Europeans actually came from? Where, where is that Iranians actually came from? That's the history that goes back millennia, even before Christ, and that survives in, in the very veins of those peoples that we, as we've also made a lot of this about them, thinking about the Greeks or the Romans, that we needed to somewhat, um, you know, secularize and modernize in our mind as kind of weird, secular, central, modern states that weren't anything at all by any standard. Um, uh, in that fashion, it actually shared an enormous deal of of warlike legacy and this kind of Indo Indo Aryan uh, traditions that came from the, the the migrations from the Caucasian steppes and spreading around. But it's something you find actually even even in other realities. I mean, Egyptian pharaohs sometimes wore I don't know wolf skin just in the same identical way you find in the this broader tribal and uh, 
uh, I can't say even nomadic because this is probably sur survives all over the world in all tribal societies of the idea of the warrior beast and this kind of possession from the deity, from the divinity that is the same forward, the same um, impetus that you find in medieval cavalry. So um, here the thing could, it really goes, uh, even at an anthropological level in many ways, we have to understand, that's why we make this, this playlist with, you know, uh, what is that th this all means and how and, and why uh, have we, especially, uh, I don't know about the rest of the world, but surely in the West we have somewhat, uh, you know, needed to, to, to transform, to uh, maybe even apologize for it in, in a sense, because where's the, that classicistic, lay, secular uh, invention of the Roman, the Greek and Roman modern centralized re state, republic, whatever, and, and and the medieval knights afterwards, and that's how we also demonized the Middle Ages in many ways. Um, how we have completely, d d you know, misinterpreted the the, the world here for centuries, and we we still live actually with this enormous burden of having to unknot all the, the mess that we made. Just today our historiography is, is fine actually is, is, is you know explaining and you know showing to us what why and how we have been mistaken as a civilization for for centuries of historiography in giving a completely uh, you know the, mm, false perspective of, of the whole thing. Um, but even today I would say in when people write about mm, chivalry, knighthood, etc. We, we somewhat do it maybe because, I don't know, we like the military sense of the story, maybe military technology, kind of warfare in general, but do we really, you know, look at the cultural aspect of the thing? Um, you know that I'm not a culturalist uh, as a, a Klausowitzian, by definition I can't be like that, but I mean, do we really, you know, detach the, the thing from maybe that even just a specific example um, and uh, and look at a at a broader uh, picture and realize what what this whole system really was aside from you know that specific time and place uh, in in history and and see that the whole flux of, of the whole flow of the thing well this is a very healthy exercise right? and we we rarely do it we are rarely we are disabituated to do it. Because actually historians up to one century ago were, were actually working at, uh, along that line. So of course they, they were mistaken in other ways. That they, they weren't probably didn't have the same level of sophistication we have. Um, but in fact this is the problem. We have overly emphasized this utter precision. But we, we have sacrificed in many ways also being competent uh, about the, the, the background. Which is dramatic. I think every person who has you know, looked into the, the academia in, in, in his or own life has realized this, right? We can't, if you have followed any historical path, university or academic path, you're, you're aware of how it's all very sectorialized and there is not much room for, you know, breathing at full lungs at this, um, at this enormous amount of, of, of information that is fortunately already being framed. I mean, we have uh, an astonishing amount of historiography to cover if we want to start being competent about the general side. But very often this general side is skipped to a cool, right, through a simple, you know, basic exam in the first year of university and then the rest is fundamentally not, not approached adequately. Um, so we have this challenge of actually tr of trying at least to, to draw a a plausible picture of the prehistory of the medieval knight, right? And this is um, this is debatable, right? What, is this really methodologically and correct and historiographically legitimate to, to draw such a prehistory, right? Is it necessary really to look at all the uh, the military history fundamentally, you know, the the, the Western world since since the ancient times? And what's you know the the Western world in this sense anyway? Um, uh, at some levels, and uh, what is said properly in others, and up to the essentially the eleventh century, right? And just to fundamentally even create a starting point to study better the uh, chivalric phenomena through the uh, centuries of its um, 
I would say uh, not necessarily central development. I don't that we're talking about the 11th to 15th century. Um, I am actually specializing exactly in the 14th, almost at the end of this period. And I can tell you that to me, uh, the, the the single most important moments in the definition of, of cavalry, I would say, but it, it's not even knighthood because knighthood really does develop net point. But what is knighthood resting on in this century? It's something that has already been formed. Right, by the 11th century, you essentially have what the in the, the not even the embryo anymore, but properly the the thing you have the knight as such, right? And um, and there is also an enormous deal that I'm not particularly fascinated by because I I don't like this kind of things. But I mean the l later revivals of 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 chivalry and knighthood in um, in culture. Uh, if you can't go in to to art in about I don't know, uh, the prayer of Raphael, it's, or, you know, neo-Gothic, all this stuff, but, um, you know, I'd never really cared. Actually, we, we are, and this is important in, in, instead, because, you know, we mostly, today, at least in popular culture, I think the, the 18th, we, we think about the Middle Ages, we're thinking actually about a, a, a tale that has been told us in the 19th century, largely, especially in certain countries in uh, in, in the in Western world. Um that uh, fortunately it's somewhat immune from <laughs> more immune from but that is still the way we will look at those that world true but even about i don't know think about the green brothers in the uh, other levels of banal even disney movies right to help you know we have as children grown up with that view with those feelings with those emotions with those stories and even if this is nothing to do with historical competence but in many ways it's how you know we are have being emotionally marked uh, not just at that level, by by that picture of the Middle Ages. Um, so, it's obvious that any attempt to lead to a final definition of, of, of the militia is um, somewhat vain, right? That there, there can't be a a single book or you know just a series of of YouTube videos like I'm doing this now we can't define sensibly the thing as a you know in a coherent complete uh, rationalized way we, we still have to to answer lots of questions about who we are in the first place and th those questions change all the time so it probably that doesn't even make sense because the and and the important part of this is that the problem remains so that history present something that unfortunately is decreasing in many at many levels of our society that is uh, the the plurality of thought right you know it seems like that thought is getting increasingly polarized there are many reasons for this we have discussed it in you know in other videos but now it's not important to remind but history is a very powerful antidote exactly because of this because it, it it's always problematic like there's not a true history you can look at there is nothing like a historical truth um, there is maybe a historical reality uh, based properly on, on the sources, but the, there is no truth. There is no uh, single way of looking at certain aspects. So you know how much I loathe moral relativism and how I, I, don't, I don't like to... I like to think there is a truth, indeed. Uh, and actually, there actually is, whatever it is, at least for, from our understanding of the world. But whether we, we can get it or not is no question. I mean the best way we can do is at least kind of direct ourselves in the right direction but truth is always in our, in our place compared to where we are um, but um, this is one of those problems that will always especially the long path of the origins of, of, of um, cavalry I, I, I will keep repeating cavalry probably because of my native uh, language and generally speaking what this whole thing m means but you know you understand I don't mean the mounted army here from from but I'm talking about cavalry as chivalry as knighthood as, uh, as all this thing that really eventually substantiates itself in 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 a military aspect of the story in a political aspect of the story today maybe we'll try to to look at very superficially at because the path of the origin is fascinating, right? And all that implies, you know, it, it, it's really an adventure. Like the first times, at least for me, when I first discovered these topics, I, I was 
or you know completely uh, fa in fact fascinated by them in a way that has become almost existential like you know the, the uh, after having read the stuff I can't look at you know the looking out of the window <laughs> or you know the people in the street and 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 thinking at at the world the same ways I, I used to do before at least I understand something of my much better even just of my feeling of my vision of the world that I realize is stemming from from historical reality that we have to to cope with to be consistent uh, individuals and we can put it in this way like between the end of the tenth and the early eleventh century the chivalric class let's call it in this way was formed Right. This was scanned by an extreme multiplicity of conditions, susceptible of uh, deep changes from place to place. And this wasn't at all a social class. Right. Uh, there were many rich as well as poor militas. There were many that were framed, for example, in a basilatic relation but that were uh, casati, that is, you know, properly... Uh, lived in a household and that therefore they made the life of the wealthy landowner uh, except but running up to arms were circumstances basalitic duties and contract previously contracted and their senores had requested them right and their masters because actually the the the, the point of the same enfiftment inf inf passes through, through this reality is not exclusively military right um, and there, w there were many militas that were part of the so-called masnata right seigneurial masnata very often that were heirs of the Germanic comitatus uh, with its uh, rituals and its um, spirits right of uh, warrior brotherhood then among the militants, the, the word definitely the free allowed years. That is, people who essentially freemen with their own land couldn't be confiscated, not even by the king, right? And that carried out the craft just like any other, right? Being a soldier is it, it is a job like any other, right? In, in terms of what jobs, uh, the word job is concerned. Right, not because it's uh, every job is different, and definitely the one of the night specifically is definitely not. But just for saying that, this was also this could be a business, right? And we see how important this was. But and aside, even in here, from for example, a juridical categorization, there was a huge variety of situations and conditions that were essentially aimed at single single circumstances that determined the employment of the term milas itself. The exemption from the ban, uh, that is, you know, you have just to fight essentially uh, or not, maybe because of the specific concession, um, and, uh, at least you don't have to fight like the, the, the others do, uh, as a levy, but just as a, as a duty of some other character, does not, con and towards certain specific people, does not constitute by itself um, the satisfactory element to spot a status by, by, by itself. So there were militas of noble condition that were distinguished by the special ranks such as the Spanish Infanzones, right? Um, there are, there were, uh, you know, others uh, that were subjected to the military service um, demanded by the, the public authorities but actually managed by um, feudatories and chastelains right and there were others uh, even non-free as we've seen with ministerialis for example that wa was actually in contrast with the ancient Germanic norm that allowed to the only to the freemen to bear arms some of them were militas regni that is knights of the kingdom while others were comrade in arms of a magnate and the m m clearest I would say dichotomy passed perhaps 
there through I mean the, the mills has that um, carried out this public function and those uh, the origins and the modalities of recruitment remain fundamentally obscure this time uh, work as private bodyguards right but this is in many ways the point like where is that the Miles stopped and let's say the vulgar minion or the armored guardian or the accolade began right uh, you can imagine in, in this world that was still relatively um, open like society had gone stratifying a big deal but at the same time the, the militia was quite open as, as a as a social class the, you know, it would crystallize much later on in the middle ages and the work proper, properly defines itself as such but you know this system already worked as a as an aggregational, as a a gluing uh, one, and if it is true that all the militias were armed, it's even truer that not all the armed people had the right to be qualified as a milis themselves, right? And it is true also that such qualification such uh, title was um, you know uh, coveted at the point that many that would have not had the, the right of it intended to to bear it to acquire it in, in some way and for example the use of objects of clothes um, of particular vests uh, we have one example, for example, the dispositions of the Abbe of Beaulieu and the permanence of the custom of the consignation of, of arms, right? Complicated perhaps by all these initiatory rituals that were used by the Masnat as a, a bit old in you know the, the military brotherhoods. Um, that is all the complex therefore of formulas and gestures that eventually uh, was transformed in, in the dubbing and that was accepted, uh, welcomed and Christianized by the church served to surround the Milas of a particular prestige that distinguished him from the rest of the armed, of the weapons carrier in many ways. And But in, in these years that we are talking about, and also going, going back in time gradually, you know, such chivalric symbology was was just beginning to be formalized, at least. And in any case, it's not documentable, because we know dramatically few about it, and mostly from sources that are not military. And this will be true for a long time. And about the military initiation, there was surely something complicated by, especially in the Christian world, by the relics of pagan magics, right? It was transmitted orally. We just have pretty, uh, you know, scanny and um, fleeting nods, right? From, for example, the epics or the iconography of the 11th century. And uh, from their side, the liturgists, as, as also the chroniclers, but uh, the word generally clergymen tend to reduce this in the shaded forms to benedictiones ensis. Right? So the, this is the the, the, ben, the blessing of the sword. And therefore, framing them is kind of this innocuous um, and habitual liturgical picture. But this was something very different. And we will have to wait for the end of the 12th century for the dubbing to actually come out of the half shade uh, and um, even uh, if at that point the Christian liturgy uh, or liturgization had reduced it to something that in fact was very different from what what it was what it originally was and uh, we, we have somewhat hinted at what this really was I mean this military bands were the, the same uh, the same exact thing that you know 
in, in, in a line of in a functional sense had descended from the comitatus, from the military bands, war bands that of, of the ancient world that were actually based on some of the most uh, single most traumatic, abusive, brutal and uh, you know wicked uh, forms of selection that you can ever imagine, right? And don't think that the medieval world was immune from this. Like a 13th century knight went through pretty much the same thing. Um, still, in, 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 in some way, at, at, in different ways at, at that point, but it's not because the thing was less, right, you know, that maybe the responsibility increased at that point, but at the beginning it was the individual, it was the force at a single valley. People died, were brought under, they, they couldn't make it sometimes. The dubbing, the slapping, the, you know, the thing was actually the, the relic of something much more brutal at the beginning that brought these joiners to almost to die because the sense was exactly to say okay you will die and re be reborn into this brotherhood so that your your life actually doesn't by itself doesn't count anything anymore this is the concept and this is in many ways the depersonalization system that works in the military in the military training you don't have to reason uh, you have first of all to to obey, to learn how to obey. Then eventually, if you display some capability in the rest, you will rise to the ranks. In this case, you will become a, a warband leader, a chieftain, whatever. But the idea is that when you enter there, you're not you, a person anymore. You're essentially a part of this mechanism, and you and you can't get out, and you can't think to get out. That that's the point. And, and you can't objectively live like a warrior of, of this centuries and pretending that you're actually, uh, you know, uh, that, that you, you, can, you, you haven't been tested to resist to the most horrifying forms of, of violence that you can ever imagine. I mean, look at what knights actually did. I mean, and not just about much about fighting with themselves uh, against each other, right? You know, look at what they did, uh, literally, in, in, in true war, it was out there. I mean, just read any chronicle from any from every century, actually, from the ancient, from the ancient times, actually, at that point, to, to even, you know, 13 to 14, look at how, but look even our, during the 30 years war, look, look at how entire countrysides were exterminated, how these people raped children in half and raped women uh, one after one after. This, is, this was the life of these people. By definition, it was not a, a, a matter of saying, you know, this thing actually works, um, you know, it, it's, it went out of hand. I mean, there were no other way to, to, to make this. And I know it sounds kind of dysfunctional, but it's not dysfunctional as long as you understand that these systems were were actually a strategical measure, because if you have to wipe out, uh, you know, a neighboring rival, um, you know, it's rare that you could achieve this total annihilation, especially with the means of this times. But definitely, you could do your worst against. And this is what war has always been. What do you think people fight like all over the world? What do you think is been happening in the Ukraine or in Syria or in Libya? Do you think that children are not raped in half? Do you think that women are not raped in a, on a regular basis? This is the face of war as we know it. And, and it, it, the face of humanity at its worst that we know. right? And it, it takes an enormous step of you know, responsibility and self-realization and ethical um, awareness to, to accept that this is human. That this is not inhuman, but this is exactly human. This is specifically, accurately, and precisely human. And you have to cope with that because it is within you. And this is what these systems were created exactly to, to carve out of you. What starts changing with the 10th, 11th century is naturally that this system starts to be regularized because these people literally were used to live in that way in a regular base. Uh, there's one point you can't leave properly like that anymore. I mean, there is a space where you can't do it, and there is a space where you can't do it. This is the major difference. It's not the lifestyle changes, but it, you, you're addressed towards a specific, um, you know, direction. 
And that takes discipline. That takes, first of all, the acknowledgement. There is an authority over your head that you have to recognize and to, to accept this order. Because otherwise you will be the next one to be ripped in half. Scorched alive. Uh, and these people knew it pretty well because they saw it every day. So the interesting aspect of this is, is naturally the disciplining, the civilization factor that kicks in that uh, of course has nothing to do with the decrease of the absolute level of violence. If there is a, 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 a frightening, a devastating, but also a beautiful lesson that we have learned from history is that the increase in civilization has literally nothing to do with any form of decrease of the destructive capabilities. The more civilization advances, the more it can destroy. By definition, uh, this is why culturalism is a failure, right? This is why pacifism is a failure, as much as militarism and anything that pretends to, to, to think that this thing is not human, as a matter of fact. That there is like a, a, a reality you can't bend human nature to your will, as if, you know, uh, millions and millions of years of evolution had no, <laughs> no impact on you whatsoever. This is not to say that culture is not important or that, in fact, these systems didn't work, but they contained within themselves actually a much higher degree of violence, at least in potential, than, than the previous ones. Because if you, you know, if a band of thugs recognizes only violence as, as a normal form of behavior, in order to curb them, you have to teach them with violence. And I mean, of course, violence exercised on themselves. And maybe that band of tags will understand something, and maybe they will become even better people at that point. Uh, it, it's kind of not much because of a moral, you know, uh, you know, positivity of violence per se, but because you're you place them in front of the alternative or either accepting and understanding why this thing is happening which expands their intellective capabilities or or to die and you see how crystalline clear this whole thing is this is exactly what transforms what we know as the the, the night of our visions of the one we watch in movies and what we, we, we read in books by which romanticism has you know uh, showed us with Wagner with the uh, with, with all the ideals of course that we have built and these ideals have been born in, in that era indeed and it was a, a regulation it was a way to to exercise more intelligently the destructive force of this world through a rationalization and in part even through a secularization and so as we have seen the militas were not a social class they were not a juridical class the militia of the last tent in the, f the early 11th century was instead maybe at least a sort of lifestyle class or a kind of of life class, right? Because it was very constitutive, right? It was very, it was growing um, exclusive, and in fact, it was a kind of life, that could, you know, characterized by life itself within a group of armed men, right? By the use of arms. And especially by the prerogatives of uh, of law, and uh, and simply the ones that were acquired with force, right? By the existential necessities, by the certain mental attitudes that all stem from this. And you understand that this this is not just a um, you know. A a peaceful process by definition. These people faced risks in common. They they often sold their services. I mean, they served actually 
um, th there is also an increase of, of mercenaries, and indeed exactly from this century, but they mostly served uh, under the same lay or ecclesiastical senior, right? Uh, with uh, even this kind of um, discontinuous reciprocal custom that derived from it, there was a leveling of the occupations of the of the gestures, right, of the competences that were imposed by the profession of arms, was the consciousness to belong to an elite that was um, clearly separated, f for example, from the rustics, the rustici, and their humiliating labor, right? That there is a choice you have to make at some point, right? This is not just about uh, deciding what you want to be. This is what you can be and the opportunities that you have. Actually, there are lots of rustics exactly in these years that make fortune and become even as milites, right? Much, be much better off than the average freeman that maybe they weren't because they may maybe were servants. This is actually very, very often. We made a couple of videos actually on the ministerialis, the origins of the ministerialis in Eastern Frankish the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, also the, the figures of the Ministerialis exactly uh, in these two centuries in um, essentially in, in Lorraine, in, 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 in Flanders, etc. And um, so all this created essentially an esprit de corps that was without any doubt stronger than the social and juridical differences and that in force of which in st in actually that the same tended to be put aside right so it's important not to classify on those two criteria right? for example the, there's the clientelary system and the redistribution uh, dynamics the so-called system of the gift that was so characteristic of the Germanic comitatus for example eventually in the courtly culture that essentially absorbed uh, the socio-economical differences, right? For those who had riches, the most beautiful and just thing was to distribute it to the friends, and uh, for those who didn't have them, to receive them was, was, was a great honor. And this thing didn't happen for charity, for mercy. You have to understand what it is. this is, because if you're fighting in a group that has to be cohesive and... Um, well driven to go out there to, 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 to kill or get killed you can't uh, fight next to a guy that I, I don't know, that is, is not properly equipped or is not properly motivated right, so this is a, a purely functional thing if you want a functional group here you have to be sure that everybody gets what, they, in part what they deserve, there is also this struggle, you know, that you know you, you, ha you are expected in order to be part of the group exactly through those initiatory rights that we were talking about before, to be, to be worthy of it you have certain duties you have, for example, never to to look uh, less than your, than your senior which is a huge deal, because the senior here is, is becoming ever more like uh, it, it's still a warrior, but it's becoming also something more in terms of a more um, civilized, uh, uh, you know, at, at least mm, we can say even lifestyle proper, which surely existed in part, but I mean the fact that he's becoming more of a manager and a businessman. Like, well, how do you think that these bands worked? Like, the, these people had castles and lands to administer, to defend, etc. So... There is on a side of that that uh, highlights the, the qualities that traditionally chieftains, even in the tribal societies, had to, to have. The chieftain was a relatively older person, was a mature warrior who had seen it all before in terms of uh, the, the worst radical violence that you can imagine. But now the, the point was having actually a brain that was, you know, fit and, you know, and, and capable and, and smart enough to, to direct where that violence of the youngsters uh, had could be useful, and, and that's command, that's discipline, that's uh, the the superiority of the uh, of the leader, the commander. That's why Bodan is a is properly the true deity of war, for example, in the Germanic uh, world, um, and not Thor, Thor, because Thor is just the young guy. Yeah, that is. That is 
big and beefy and it drinks and kills giants and all this stuff, but, you know, uh, he's, he's like the Hercules of the situation. But if you want someone who really gets it, who really gets a, a deeper understanding of, of the world and you know, looks beyond it in the truest um, border, in fact, the true difference, the true barrier that separates life from death, that, that you have to look at the older one, right? And and this is the senior proverb in this in this context that fights alongside his man, but he's still someone who who works at a, at a higher level, at, uh, even of politics and society, right? And think that kings at this time live like that in the same way. So it's, it's the, the military activity is still very much out there um, as a duty of the leader, as an individual fighter but the, the collective thing is is gradually taking over because it's you know it's all about the collective training uh, over the individual uh, prowess that that makes the transition from the tribal world that is from barbarity to you know to to, to organize at this point to the feudal world that makes civilization at least in, in these times and that will gradually evolve in something else right and that's why you know uh, uh, a 17th century musketeer, the, the end of the century could knock down, uh, you know, a 10th century cavalry, you know, if they, if they ever met all of a sudden, right? It's not because the, the, the 17th century guy is actually much of a individually better person, but because simply he ha he comes from a from a reality that um, that has functionalized him to collective. Use like maybe even a 10th century knight would may be able to, to knock down a single musketeer, but that you understand what the point is is that civilization crushes the warrior, right? Fortunately, so because you wouldn't like, believe me, you would never like to live in a tribal society after having known what, the, what we have here today and how you know billions of liters of blood this has costed, right? And and you can't be sure if it costed so much. It's really the, the better way, right? Not all these, you know, uh, nostalgic, uh, you know, simpletons that believe that the tribal world was the the, the beauty of, of life and the true life. Yeah, and the thing, you know, the, the, those people are insane. They're they are utterly insane and radically ignorant and uneducated. But we know that these. Uh, ideologies are more spread amongst the unschooled, but th that's exactly the difference between, in fact, the warrior that is very much like the, the thug that doesn't know this, doesn't know this thing, and he who can act intelligently and crush the thug simply with a snap. This is civilization. It's the the control of violence, and if you need a system where that single guy is the warrior, you know that sis that system is primitive. It fails. Right, once it finds a civilized one, made by people who are capable of making a collective effort in an orderly fashion. Right, this is literally, I mean, the path of civilization passed through the slaughter of the warrior. And this, this is beautiful in itself because it really frees uh, the human potential from realizing what instinctively, more instinctively, seems the unthinkable. The human nature has way more sympathy instinctively for the warrior not for the soldier. Um, uh, but we, we know how it ends, right? So um, I also will not digress again on the, the, the shameful and uh, illiterate resuming of the term warrior applied to our modern military, which is, you know, sheer historical illiteracy at every level. But, you know, that's a serious problem because it tells you that... Uh, you know, someone is 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 playing on the the, the simplicity and the in education of people by using those terms because that's exactly how it works. And whoever does it knows what what that is about. And it's obviously ideological. It's obviously propagandistic. Um, the 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 system of distribution of wealth is is exactly made to absorb these differences as we've seen. I mean, in the Germanic Comitatus, of course, the shift then, after the slaughter, distributed all the spoils of war to the, to, to his warriors, right? And the, the ideal thing was even to settle down some point, right? The, the Comitatus puts itself in March in the most primitive world because of essentially a demographic problem and 
coupled with you know with famine with the impossibility of producing locally how much was needed to feed everybody so these young males were sacrificable in that regard and they were however still the the the, the, the fittest right uh, for the role went out in these bands sometimes extremely young look at Harold uh, Harold or I don't know how many hundreds followers he had when he was already like I don't remember what 14 I believe like these are people that naturally aged also much more quickly than we do and this is very important and were acknowledged m much more hardly to, to, to the reality um, of life and especially of that lifestyle than we are right and and it was a brutal ferocious competition at every level it's not that within the same band there wasn't a struggle for the top for example and we know this uh, on a regular basis but even in the comitatus there was this kind of ideal discipline for which you were essentially a, a, a personal property of the date of war you couldn't dispose of your life or ignore of yourself by the slightest and you, you just had to die if you were asked but naturally uh, this is not much of an order that you can impose unless you have a, a true power to, to crush the descent right that's why the modern state crushes the tribe because because it has that power so but it's at an embryonal stage it this thing develops in, in every human society at every level of human society you know, by a certain margin and the distribution here was an enormous deal it was really about purchasing the, the the fealty of your troops this is exactly what it was right it wasn't about in fact charity wasn't about but it was a, a practical realization that in many ways the dis redistributing the wealth which was actually the, the basic uh, socio-economical system in pre-industrial times by, by all standards because other, without which the society simply could not work was in fact the only way to, to, to make society functional right it, it's ridiculous when you you hear those classes interpretations in history when reading ah oh, the feudal system just the noblemen had everything and all the peasants were serving to that the noblemen reinvested constantly everything they had Right. This doesn't mean that maybe they, they didn't, um, you know, blackmail the, the peasants, you know, uh, with uh, with uh, the harvest that they maintained in the stocks of their castles when in case of famine, etc. But that still had happened because there had been a cooperation between the two, and um, and still that was, you know, he who wanted to survive out of the system of all the other lords trying to destroy him and seize his land, he had to to build. Our fortifications had to provide weapons for, for for these companies that defended the territory, and that's how the seigniory spreads, right? And these people were chronically out of, of of wealth, right? And that's the whole problem of feudalism as it transforms, right? That, that the whole deal is to find enough resources to to do something extra, to do something more. And civilization wins here because even by very small degree that there is the point in which you're brought to the to the to the realization that if you don't put that stuff in common you, you will be wiped out right if you don't put that stuff in common to, to he, he who is competent to lead that Germanic world already showed that you know that that uh, military power is conferred to someone it was a very risky thing right but during only during times of war then hopefully when war was over all this power went back to those who had given it it's social contract that history takes um, different paths that the outcome can be mixed but at least it's a necessity at a certain point um, and and still in terms of differences for example the Vassi Casati uh, the free uh, uh, Alloderi the Militas of the Masnata were maybe not freemen right but maybe not freemen but they were of scarce importance right the most important thing was to be armed right the true difference was between them and the armless that is between the bellatores and the laboratores right there is a guy who has to fight and there is a guy who has to work and don't think that the guy who has to fight because owns the weapons but has it better much better than the, the worker simply two different ways of leaving that surely 
like it, I don't think in this sense that the worker, the laborer, had it necessarily better. Actually, you know, it seems it was. I mean, it's a, it's a tough um, comparison in here, but naturally everything had a cost that is to be understood once again in the broader logic of how these systems even originate. The Bellatores and the Laboratores had chosen by a certain degree to be in these terms between each other. Right, and and the same peasantry sometimes and up to the, the 14th century actually, don't don't think it was uh, something passive, peaceful, like the, the knights were the evil, kind of militaristic guys and the the, the the peasants were the poor pacifistic guys. Actually the most nonsensical and wicked and uh, inane violence you can imagine was carried out by the peasantry during the needle. I mean, some of the, the greatest blood baths with the true rage and anger, surely stemming from from oppression, from even in there, some of the greatest cruelties and violence and then that, that you could imagine, but at least the knight knew how to also apply a certain degree of coordination of intelligence to, to, to a broader thing. The peasants uh, as long as you know society was relatively simpler, they they could even check the the knights. We we know it. It happened. It happened actually in the tenth century, eleventh century, much more than would happen I don't know, in the fourteenth, right? Uh, in the fifteenth. But at a certain point, you know, the, the elites rise up, the society rise up, civilization rise up. It, the peasantry remains where it was. So there is this increase that happened. It's not part of these centuries, but um, it's um, it's a war that the peasantry lost, uh, and and the reason why you lose a war is because you lack moral and, and or intellective resources. So don't think of the knight as the violent guy that oppresses the peaceful guy, because that's not the narrative, right? It's the the intelligent guy, the developed guy that, that crushes the the least. Uh, you know, uh, developed in in that sense. So, it's that that's the controversial aspect of the rise of civilization that we're talking about before. But the interesting thing is that civilization improved in in the meanwhile. So that against any classist interpretation, this this thing went on. I mean, even class struggle has its own place at some point in history. Don't, let's not rule it out, but. It, it, it's not the, the totalizing. You you can't explain how you know if this was the case, you would think that the Middle Ages would end within itself because the world system would be crushed by the terrible landlords that simply starve to death the peasants. If, if you starve to death the peasants, you you starve to death the the the, the entire system and, and you died with it. And this didn't happen. On the contrary, and. The reason why we we don't live in the, in those in that state anymore, and you can be sure that we you all descend whoever you are from a peasant. Uh, back in the, in the day, uh, well, well, that's the point. You're not a peasant anymore, likely. So, and even if you are one, you're you're not that kind of peasant, right? That so, this is an impacting, a very impacting. Uh, truth in many ways. There is, there is the middle class that is actually the greater mover at some point, but not all, right? Because actually we have seen how the feudal society, proper, properly the, the the chivalric elite was the one that made the the European revival of the high middle ages from a, an economical point of view, from a, at, at many levels, in a rationalization of, of, of economy, of production, of the expansion of spaces and moving these people and 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 really peasants were you know the, the most precious thing here is literally their labor force right um, arms at a certain point do not work anymore uh, armor there is someone who has to make them if you don't have enough surplus you can't have anything in that regard so actually you really want to preserve your own labor force and uh, the, the imbalancements began in, in, in more articulated systems, but still in a improved condition because of these people. So, but these are other 
digression. So when we look at these periods, naturally we we observe the lack of, say maybe not the yeah maybe the lack, not the absence of public powers, right? You know these that corresponds to this state of fact and that mentality that could not but lead to the endemic situation of um, overimposition of the strong and of the armed over the weak and the arm uh, armless right you know they of the powers and their and their followers over the pauperous over the humiles right over the po uh, the poor over the humbles and the chivalric group class let's call it class is is therefore uh, being born uh, as a class of of prevaricators right of of uh, of people who impose over others you know of rapacious predatory animals in many ways and this is the first nature I mean the the, the first way they they start uh, addressing their newly organized violence is expanding over this world and taking it over right and that's where you indeed see the the the, the violence be being really delivered on on the other classes but still but still building a system that is capable of keeping expanding and you can't keep expanding simply by destroying everything uh, everything and everybody you, you find in front of yourself right so as we were saying before yeah, there are entire countrysides that get wasted. There are entire populations that get slaughtered. Daily business. But what these people contained and maintained was growing. It was growing in terms of people. It was growing in terms of you know their income. It was growing in 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 terms of you know how these societies began even to to look at each other and could coordinate each other on a broader scale, right? The, the, the feudal monarchies we made a video about that kept growing exactly in this base, right? And never think that this was anarchy. There were terrible evil knights that killed just for fun. This is not the, the thing. They didn't do it for fun, right? Even when they were killing innocents, right? They were doing it with a cold logic that we can't embrace now today because we, we reason it in a, in a completely different sense, but that actually happens every time you you actually go at war and you see what you need to do in order to accomplish something for someone else's benefit and this is also what we should be very aware of what history is that history is not what you wish for to happen history is about what actually happens and and there are certain reasons for which it happens that you, you don't understand immediately that you have to study a lifetime just to even get a tiny part of, 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 of the mechanic of, of the world thing and as in this process, in these terrible expansion, that there is um, the division of the night that starts also taking place in our world, right? The ancestral terror that is inspired at their at their appearance, right? These blocks of iron, of of uh, sound resounding iron, right? On these frightful horses, right? There are figures that are ch loaded with a an ancient sacral horror, right, and a new, and now with Christianity, a new apocalyptic terribility, right, you know, it's, and, and these are what really knighthood was, right, I, I hate even modern art that is pretty good, um, doesn't get this, like, we, we, where you get modern artists drawing a, like the, the the a knight, the the thing they want to do it it's that it's shiny, it's cool, looks cool, etc. But you, you what you really want to to show is how scary that these people actually were, and and this visions of of deities, right? Considered that because this is the whole origin since the Bronze Age, but you, when these people covered in in metal arrived in, in a place, think about Mycenaean Greece, you know, did this. Uh, Homeric heroes descending with a dendro panoply, you know, you know, of a local uh, Greek uh, coast, and the local peasant just ate cereals. These guys are beefy to eat meat, and drink wine, and they're enormous, covered with all this shiny thing, and 
and they are undefeatable. There is no ATGM to knock you down at night. There is no tank, there is no plane. These things, if they want, they can rule the earth, and they do. These people were demigods. This is the pure meaning of the night. That there is something superior, ancestrally, spiritually, morally, violently, um, religiously, politically, socially in a night. These people are those who come and see what they take, and, and, and you can't simply deal with them. Because there's something superior, and this is what it's being concealed also by the sources that want just to normalize the thing, for example, in a Christian sense, that surely contributed to the, the civilization we're talking about because they realized the importance of addressing this force in a, in a more rightful, uh, you know, just, and, you know, sensible and coherent and regulated direction, right? Um, but these people really come from a, from a background of tribal pagan ancestry that that doesn't reckon that doesn't even know what that logic is. As I often say, read um, Jean de Joinville's um, Life of Saint Louis. And we are in the 13th century. The high nobility of France, still at that time, fully Christianized since, since you know, uh, centuries and centuries, still didn't understand anything about Christian theology. But I mean anything. I mean, these people literally believed, as Jean de Joinville writes, that it's useless to pray to God if it doesn't make you win a battle. This is, by definition, pure contractualistic paganism. By sheer definition. And it's not that these people didn't believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They did, but they attributed to their religion completely different meanings from what the ones that were, for example, the ones of the church, normally in the previous centuries, especially the ones we're talking about today, actually wrote the story. There's no conspiracy, it's simply a different type of mindset. You know, religious people could be even come, actually, very often, especially the most educated, in from the same families of knights, the same nobiliar ethics, but still, you know, kind of oriented towards another side of the story. And the point is exactly this, is that we we see it. I personally dealt with this thing during. I remember my master thesis. I had to to, to realize even even still in in the 13th century how realistic actually were the idealist uh, you know the the let's say the chivalric morals of war. More specifically, how righteous, how honorable, and uh, you know fair was considered. For example, a flank attack by a concealed um, a concealed task force during a pitch battle uh, for in fact the chivalric ideal and the 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 reality of you know what this knights knew and these knights probably at that time had a sense of it but uh, others didn't and after all even we don't know because the sources are written exclusively on the base of that uh, moral ethics and in many ways we will never know it so don't think that we know these things right maybe for the 13th century night it was just about getting the battle won doesn't matter if you, you concealed it also because they started doing basically lots of battles during that century and someone must have dealt with the thing and decided that and it, uh, especially at the higher level so but these are com actually complex topics, but th that's exactly the point I would like to, to, to stress, that um, we, we have concealed, uh, inadvertently, som sometimes on purpose, because naturally a Christianized version of the story has to, to contain a certain message about the, the whole logic, right, of you know, who was right, who was wrong, and not who used which tactic to how, what the, the individual knight thought. Who cares, right? Um, but that's the problem why we don't know. And and from the, 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 the hints we have, the few for scan information we have, we, we actually realize that the reality was dramatically different. This has been studied, for, for example, even for the Byzantine Empire, there's this prejudice that fundamentally the, uh, the, the you know, the the orthodoxy in the Byzantine war was somewhat more 
careful about the concept of shedding blood and you know penitence etc than in the west aside from we made a video on, on this comparison and maybe actually not on the comparison but on the uh, this penitence in in western europe etc and uh, in the west people cared after i mean nice i mean these same people were talking about it was the same the same centuries in that video uh, compared to this one and uh it still existed, but if you look at Byzantine, uh, those few Byzantine sources that look at the reality of, I don't know, Byzantine soldier behavior, I know that there are studies for the 7th century, which is astonishing, because the 7th seven, se seven century is the most dramatically underdocumented period in, in Western history in that regard, including the Byzantine Empire, I mean, in Western history, of course, in during Middle Ages, um, and we know that this world was now Christian since centuries uh, and that the average Byzantine soldier m moral was purely pagan without no exception that, that is to say you know it was all about I mean these people essentially believed to be Achilles to be you know the same glory of the warriors that was no concern whatsoever about oh, I shed someone's blood and these were all Christians Right, it's not that they weren't. Um, so you understand here the the, the multi-layered reality of, of 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 this war. So we we don't have to be fooled by any kind of idealism relatively to, to what the chivalric world really was, because doing that is exactly falling into the ideology, you know, the 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 moral standards that were employed exactly to stem actually this individualistic disorder that that, 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 that the, the tribal origins had still and it, it it took an enormous effort like this is a process I mean other civilizations historically speaking took much less we often talk for example how hard but objectively was a very hard struggle to turn for the Romans to transform the Italic warrior in, into a Roman legionnaire um, which was, was an enormous effort and an extremely violent one, um, albeit successful, but that lasted some some century, right? Even if the context was slightly different, but you know, for, for the medieval knight, it took way more than that. And part of the reason being that it was like not a, such a strong state like the Roman one, and any other stronger kind of centrally organized empire, like in the Middle Ages, but. Uh, uh, it's it's all the more interesting in this sense that the push came from from f locally speaking, right? That even Christianity had an enormous role in this, right? Christianity really spread in a in a capillary sense all over the territory and and made an enormous effort to transform this Romano Germanic chieftains in, into you know people that considered the the ethical problem as a as a strategy right as part of this strategical culture and never underestimate this that you know Christianity poses certain problems that are not a matter of saying you know you have to do this rather than that Christianity really tells you look you have you are, you are the one who is, is is going to make a change right there's not a preset uh, direction you have to take so you're taken away from the responsibility of choosing you have just to obey this law and you're you're fine Christianity tells you that you have to decide step by step by yourself and always remembering that this world is something that there is something greater than this and this uh, at an ethical level in sense of responsabilization is probably one of the single most important um, pillars in which Western civilization rests right and 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 this has a lot to do even with the fact of why medieval civilization didn't die out while for example the ancient one did uh, at least you know in you know in a in, in the sense that it went down at some point like change never died out it, the Middle Ages collected its legacy but the Middle Ages created the Renaissance right it's not that there is a fall at some point um, on the contrary, the moment of crisis in the Middle Ages comes up with these things that are astonishing, including the same military class that we see here, 
because this was a way to regulate and discipline society. You don't think that society was easy to, 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 to control and discipline. And if you look at, once again, the behavior of these lords and their retinues, etc., of course, there was plenty of brigandage. There was, uh, you know, these knights were, were a bunch of thugs, and as we have seen, some brute beasts in, in, in many ways, but they were at least starting to be led by someone who who knew how to discipline and, and tame these brutal beasts to, to achieve something that had to do with giving a an order to a society where you know the Carolingian Empire had collapsed, you know, public authority was absent. So these people had to take matters in their own hands. And if you study at their at their policies, their logics, their strategies, at every level, not just from a military point of view, from a patrimonial point of view, for uh, in, in a juridical sense, these you, there are no, there is an enormous it's extensive literature in this. These people were following an iron logic that has really nothing to do with with cruelty per se. These people were dictating. This is very important. I assume I would like to uh, to to maybe to to deepen the thing at one point. Even even in previous times. I mean, if you look at the sixth century, uh, the the migration era. When if if you want this. Uh, military uh, element was re-injected from the steps in a in a truly uh, cultural sense in, in Europe that never quite forgotten it but you know now had to to pass this new reorganization the, the church sometimes represents um, and and that's where most of the, the our history historical knowledge comes from you know like the idea of this disciplining there was a objectively happening at the time thanks to the church, but at the same time it was a logic probably of the secular nobility. Read Gregory of Tours, for example, about the Frankish cows. I mean, if you read this story, it sounds like these were children that were just about killing each other in most stupid ways, etc. But if we rationalize the, the, those near beautiful work by Gregory of Tours, we, we all owe him so much about Frankish history and so on, but probably would a, a much greater logic, even in there, right, than, than we, we generally realize, uh, or we're willing to acknowledge f for that matter. Um, and, and, and this violence was so pervasive that there was... Uh, that it all fit in the mechanism. That's what I tried to, to explain before, you know, trying to be too, too morally shocking, but I, I must make the point, because otherwise the, this whole thing without violence the, it cannot be understood. Like, if you pretend to, to, to read history without violence, which is essentially a, an endless bloodbath, you know, you, if you don't understand, if you refuse to understand violence, you, you refuse to understand the world, history, humanity, and everything, like the intelligence in a nutshell, right? So, um, be open to the fact that violence is nothing but a mean that you can't kill people even without violence in a much worse way that, than, and violence is just a mean if this was for those times mechanics where if you look at the base of power the resources available objectively was normal to be regularly employed so there is nothing surprising as we've seen before how the armed men were so accustomed to violence and the the armless even uh, even more to, to, to simply suffer that to, to be subject to it so mm, the question after this disconcerting picture for, I, as I assume it is for many at least and you know, at least I like to explain it in this way because I, I think that it makes much more of an impact than, you know, if we still make the, the, the happy, you know, filmsy story of the Middle Ages with the castle and the knight comes out of it and the peasants that uh, grow the, the crops all around and the whole thing. Well, uh, th this is as crude as it can get. You can get um, and I presume it's it's the, the right way of... of, of of looking at that world, um, at least a w as a perspective, right? Because that world was even not just about fire. But that element, uh, if you take it out of the equation, everything crumbles. So you can't explain the rise of chivalry, right? But the interesting aspect in this regard, which is fascinating, thought-provoking, controversial one, is why 
do we believe, for example, at the medieval night as a way more beautiful individual than, I don't know, a business broker of our times? Uh, and the question should also be, if we really care about violence, and as in a Clausewitzian sense, as an instrument of politics, why do we think that the medieval knight is more terrible? And to our eyes, our subjective popular cultural perception is definitely more terrible of a of a tank crewman or a, jet, a war jet pilot of our days. With that delivers more death with a blink of an eye. A medieval knight or a or a modern military man? What do you think <laughs> the answer is? But to us, of course, the medieval knight is more terrible. So this is another aspect of Western and uh, you know cultural legacy, the beauty and and terribility, right? And uh, that uh, have their own archetypical reason, right? Uh, that we have highlighted, for example, in other videos when we talk about the ancient uh, equestrian gods and the uh, shamanic equestrian rites. And it all passes through that, right? The same reason why today, while watching, uh, I don't know, a series on Netflix that shows, I don't know, medieval knights that clash, etc., you are thrilled. Uh, it's because of somewhere in the Caucasian steppes in uh, 5th century BC, there was some uh, newly recruited warrior into this military war pants that was entering through the initiatory right in, in, in the business through the frenetic inf infernal um, race and, uh, and music that was mimicking and resounding like you know uh, a horse clopping of a shaman that was introducing him to the craft of, of killing other humans, even if you have no idea of what this happens historically speaking, but th that's the connections. That's the connection, and the violence of the militas of the 10th to 11th century um, was accepted. Right? This is the point. This is not a matter of accepting some a, a violence passively. Right? The same rustic, the same peasants were creating the the idea of the semblances of the the archetypical figure of a superior force, a divine, unstoppable, irresistible force. Because that force of the night is deeply felt in a way or in another. And don't think that the peasants didn't know what that pagan past was. They knew probably even more uh, at some levels. Uh, than this world was secularizing fast of the existence of a superiorly just force within that sword, within that armor, within the person that lived inside of it and fought in and 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 this is the uh, you know the, you can think of a tragic side, a tragic reality, but in this relation between the wolves and, and lambs, there is, there is the way that that, that world made it to the next stage. And this is not to give for granted. It's no different of how we delivered violence to free the world from tyranny during World War II. How do you think that could be carried out? Um, and, and there's a pretty striking, lucky series of events, after all. Uh, we could have all fallen under, easily, under National Socialism, under Communism, 
uh, we could wake up today and live under totalitarianism. Um, fortunately, we we don't. Many people live under dictatorships and authoritarian regimes, and there's nothing to kid about that because, unfortunately, still this is an enormous deal, and often in the same places that threatened the 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 world before uh, from was not very long ago after all uh, but we we made it and one of the reasons we made it it's called resistance it's called the liberation which equated sometimes to, to race to the ground entire cities and not just killing you know uh, people with a gun in their hands ready to to, to pull the trigger pointing at you We're talking about women and children that remain buried under those uh, ruins right and and that is something that when you realize that this is the same reason why we we make uh, like is it was it worth it well probably but you will never find that this is a weak point of our civilization in some ways that you will not find a person who's okay well it was good to do it Right, you know, it was better at least. You know, you know, it was at least we have won something more precious because we put at the center of the fact that it's even right, of course, to say, okay, well, that human life has no price. Yes, you you never know because we assume that, but unfortunately, so, and this is where Christianity gave a great boost to to our intelligence for that matter. Is that there is a logic that just pertains to this earth here, and there is another logic that pertains to something that. We can just hope for. And that why we can't wish for that dream to happen. Uh, still we have to deal with the reality of this earth. That that doesn't often put you in front of a much one option. So that's where we should be challenged. Not to just shut this by the, you know, the two dimensions, the, this this eternal struggle, after all, that we must have if we want to be righteous, conscious, ethical people, um, and this is why history should be taught in in the most horrifying sides of itself. Because if you don't get that, you you can't you can't fundamentally see why reality happens and why we need it to to fight and why so many people fought for arms and men killing their their fellow men just for for something that evidently was albeit controversially apart uh, uh, you know uh, apparently uh, oxymoric right you know to say okay I have to kill someone to save someone else but that unfortunately is is what we we coped with since the the dawn of times and of humanity and it, what is that you can't really do to change this to, to shut your your ears to cover your eyes and pretend this is not true uh, and there, there is this religious aspect that I particularly care for because we as you know we made a lot of videos on medieval um, Medieval religion, medieval Christianity, a lot, of course, because we mostly talk about Europe. But you know, of religions in general, you can find many parallelisms in in many, in many, in basically any civilization that always has such a struggle in in a way in that, in which religion or however the spiritual dimension, always um, has a uh, a necessary role in, in this. Exactly to to say let's let's make an order let's let's try to, to make something but that is really based on on our spiritual force on, on our possibility to change of our ideas to make an impact right uh, the 10th century had seen uh, being born and prospering the militas right and the sacralization of this work had passed through the clash against the pagans right uh, Europe had seen in this period the exhaustion of the pagan threat right the the tribal uh, you know here 
paganism and tribalism, we've seen it. If there, there, there's that video we made one month ago about the Carolingian conquest of Saxony, it deals with that, and that you know is relative to much of these side of the story, but one century before, a bit more. But um, you know, the the tribal society was pagan because it was tribal. And as it was tribal, therefore, it was also, as, as we've seen, uh, habituated to violence and to prevarication. And, and this is what paganism supported in many ways. W what were pagan ethics, morals? Peacefulness, equality, happiness. Look at what paganism was, right? It was a product of its own context. Therefore, it was about violence about the glory of conquest, about the superiority of the strongest, uh, it was about the tragic destiny of the world, so nothing of that at all. So if you wanted something better, you had to crush this view. And largely, actually, the, 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 the process of Christianization w was not violent at all, right? It was mostly the same aristocracies of the tribal you know, the pagan world that began to say, you, you know what, in, in this model that the Franks are spreading here to, from this side or Byzantines from this other, there is something that works because it allows us to, to centralize more, to, to control more the, the, the people, the territory, to put a bit more of order, to make trade more prosper, to, to generally manage in a more rational fashion this whole thing. It's not a surprise that the thing starts from the elites, right? There is nothing... Um, that that's a that was a path of self civilization, right? You know, it took a lot of time eventually to to, to uh, and and blood indeed at at some point to to make people accept that model, right? But it's not that Christianity per se was enforced through violence, as many people would like to 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 to, to actually show. Actually, Christianity was the first one that said, you know, let, let's try to do this thing in a way that doesn't create problems, uh, you know, doesn't get people killed. Right, uh, because after all, killing was 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 a regular reality as we've seen in the tribal world. Right, it's not that the West was generally most more peaceful, but surely was more orderly. Or surely, you know, conflicts was were was resolved generally speaking in proportion, a more sensible, rationalized, and you know, a lucid way that it was in the tribal world. It was constantly war w at all times. Like the myth that these were peaceful, prosper, you know, notion societies that you know began to make war just because they were at some point were Christianized by some evil king, but it's 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 nonsensical farce. Uh, the tribal society was literally spending the whole time about killing each other, um, from clan to clan, from tribe to tribe, and uh, and even in there, there is not something morally. Uh, debatable if you realize that there was no other option given the fact those were you know poorer areas of Europe like in the north and in the east uh, that couldn't satisfy as we've seen the local demographic needs people ne needed to, to expand to, to, to literally wipe out others to, to find a new land to settle and they created a moral system that justified it then someone showed them that that was wasn't maybe the best way and after all they were changing themselves uh, more slowly than at the paces of the uh, of the of the West, then uh, and and they 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 realized that after all it wasn't that bad to to take that direction fully and to to give an order. What, what was according to you better, like uh, I don't know, ninth century Denmark or twelfth century Denmark, just in terms of sheer you know, levels of, you know, of order, of rule, of organization, of civil uh, cooperation, just, just guess. Um, and the Militas had protected, in a way, uh, the West. The point is, who would protect them, in turn, right? And the question at that point was obviously just some of themselves, right? And as we've, we were saying before, the monarchies were stemming from that same military reality that the kings were essentially knights themselves. 
and that's where that is probably born the chivalric ethics that is hinged on the uh, movement of the so-called Pax Dei that was promoted by, by the church and in fact the ecclesiastical reform of the 11th century and it, it, it's exactly this that really happens now the militants that adhered to the new Christian program operated in fact especially for a conversion right first of all of themselves and eventually of their colleagues right that didn't intend to, to curb to the new ethics because that meant most of the time saying you know I don't accept authority I mean, we have to be fair about this. That authority is needed uh, as a hierarchy, in a, hierarchically speaking, in a society to work. Uh, primitive societies do not have authorities, or they have it and they remain with where they are, and they they don't go much further. And and here's the passage, because the more these program is enforced, the more the milas is accepts to be framed into an ethical. Uh, morals uh, to an ethical um, system of reference, right? So, with a clearly defined moral um, code that is to actually protect, is oriented to protecting society, right? Is 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 aimed at protecting the the poor, the armless, right? Those who, after all, make us eat and 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 trade stuff because they produce it for for us, and they are after all the people we know that that help us, you know, even just having the power that we have, right? Uh, ha we, we have to stop those who oppose this plan, right? You know, um, it's the, the, those knights that refused to accept to be protectors and chose instead to remain oppressors of the powerless of the poor had to be put aside, had to be crushed. Right, so this was truly an object of pacification, of civilization, of of growth, of moral growth. There was a higher logic that had to be responded here. You couldn't go around wherever you were, commit violence. It was an authority on the territory. There was a king that, or or a or a vassal that, you know, if you just want to be the errant knight that went wherever he wanted without permission and just to to have a living simply pillaging and and butchering and and and, and all this stuff you you would meet uh, some more other knight that would find you would, would would hang you to a tree and something tells me that you would change start changing your mind right and maybe some peasant would remain alive because of that and they would produce something more and would you know be framed into a better system with better roads better communications with bridges built with mills uh, of course of course the process happens through the gradual extension of someone's private authority over this all as we've seen public authority is fundamentally weak but the same public authority is going to be revived through the system and there will be the time in which even the high nobleman will be tamed by the king to say now this system has to to function in a more orderly fashion we have to grow right we have to administer more effectively we have to you know to operate for a, a greater stabilization of this all we can't allow ourselves to be divided to be uh, acting you know in different fashion in front of of the enemy unity is a fundamental principle in this regard and it's here that the Milas, as we know it, that becomes the beautiful one, right? It, it happens for, for many other ways, like these people even consider beauty to be a, a value, for example. That, that's one relic of paganism that actually existed, that had to do even with the, the, the myth of the, you know, the purity of blood of this thing. You know, there were certain hideous um, attitudes in this regard from the knights that started thinking to the nobility, especially to be to be superior almost racially to I don't know to the peasantry that those people were barely human beings that there are ugly and dark and disgusting sides of this story you, you can't deny that uh, but it was still better in many ways than before than it that it had been before um, because before simply we got crushed 
was considered to be inferior. At least now, the knights recognize among each other that they are somewhat respectable, and, and that, re that respect is owed now to the whole client clientele that descended from um, to, to the ranks, right, in their possessions, in their dominions, including them, and kind of, you know, preserving them, like, not trying not to, to make upset that knight, because after all, you know, you could even fight against him, but, you know, he was still one of yours, right? Um, this is extremely important. Um, and, and that's where the knight starts fighting against the anti-knight, right? That's all the, the myth, even in the chivalric ethics, you know, think about the, the you know, the all these figures, the symbolism attached even to colors, uh, to animals, you, to these moral system was ever more codified in this sense. And and what is important is this: this is not mere talk. This is not mere idea, right? This moral code works because it, it has costed. Actually, it has costed an enormous lot. It has costed an ecclesiastical hierarchy to struggle to maintain or it has caused it, you know this the conviction that you know these people to these people that after all it was better to me it was an education you can't have a a knight of this time if you don't you know intensively christianize him right if you don't make him believe truly in the system so to the knight in order to be knight proper actually was not enough just the arm the horse the force the training the courage right but the knight now to be one needed a will, the adherence to a moral norm, the acceptation of it was marked still by an initiatic right, initiatory right, excuse me, um, that was in many ways the relic of what had also been before, and it was the union of a lifestyle and a professional specialization with an ethical mission and a social problem, um, program to make the medieval knight. A union of prowess and wisdom, right? Of exercise of force and cult of justice. You didn't find the same thing before, right? Wisdom and justice, something that, you know, prowess and exercise of force is, is a bit distant from. So you can't always find it back in the day in every war band of the most tribal and pagan background, but it was still in a very. Um, less, uh, you know, evident degree. Where the principle was truly the force, and this is something that should be understood uh, there, that there is something that we, we all emerge from, just biologically, evolutionally speaking, that doesn't look quite at things like wisdom or justice. It had to make its way through, like, literally, you know, by the, the most brutal selection, that probably the history of life on Earth has seen throughout all this uh, this time, and surely, in, in reality, we we, can, we have to admit even the the the, the shortcomings of, of this system, like the events of great part of chivalry, uh, remained no, definitely not very exemplar, but the self awareness of knighthood uh, remained concretely, right? It it actually transcended, he, he went beyond the Middle Ages. In, in a way, it already existed a bit before, as we have just seen. But it it still arrives, and this is powerful, right? It, through the, you know, the dark ways of um, the unconscious and the, the, the tortuous ones of semantics to a certain code of value that even today is far from extinction. Right? We still live in many ways that moral code. We still live by the realization that uh, we must use justice um, sometimes even with sword in hand and that there is something about it that is able to 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 exalt us in a in a positive sense, right, and make us thrilled, right, much of um, of this process is, is properly conflictual, but it is perceived to be for a good cause, and, and this is part of the reason why we still 
believe in fact that uh, even as secularized modernized people that uh, a medieval knight was after all more way more beautiful than a business broke uh, uh, at this point and, and this is um, not to be given for granted either because it's a legacy that we have from the past that we of which we forget the the origins of but that we can all easily instinctively um, uh, understand the the importance we we get the feeling of what this is all about after all that there is something righteous in 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 delivering justice um, helping the oppressed and punishing the the oppressors right the, the, this this is still part of a, a, the world you know the the dialectic of, of the world political spectrum think about it every single political side fundamentally tells the same thing and in fact there is something that transcends the same chivalry per se but that found in the western world a major element of um you know, uh, of uh, a major part of or of its origins within that, right? And we have yet to explain why, you know. But if you think that the militia took over the world in Europe, uh, like in in the ten and eleventh century, and it basically remained till the the eighteenth, the 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 twentieth century, depending on the timelines as we've seen before. Well. At this point, you, you start realizing why <laughs> it's still very strong today, and it could be lost, technically. And if that was lost, I think we would lose an, an, an enormous um, element of our check and balance system. Because without the contradiction of, in fact, of prowess and force, and wisdom and justice, as to couples we we would lose the means we would lose the close of it in reality you can't uh, you can't do anything if you're wise and just but you you're not mm, powerful and 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 uh, strong to enforce the the righteousness of your principles. So these are not two things that you can't give up. Always beware of every person that demonizes violence per se, that, that doesn't demonize the principle that decides the thought, the intention, the, uh, the will that that uses it. Because between that there is the difference between the passes between tyranny and resistance to tyranny. And if we lose that, we lose everything we have built here as a true civilization right and uh, and there is hope because after all this is a, a common process in many other contexts right there is, this is not uh, an exclusively western thing this is a story like the the, the passage from from the tribe um, and to, from let's say paganism to like gr larger you know more developed systems with a with a more unified and hierarchical mm, spiritual code is 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 being what we can't say the, the world grew with um, and but for now we we stop here because I, I wanted this video to be short even at least, you know it's not it's not been the case but I, I I didn't I am actually happy that I stressed the the importance of such at least of the implications of this topic anyhow uh, for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye